Yeah, hi there. This is Bernard Cup from C.J. Lawrence in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, it is March 28th, and we are right at the end of the first quarter, and it's a spectacular quarter. This is the best uh, first quarter that we've seen since 2019. Uh, we've had back-to-back -back quarters now of 10% uh, performance for the market, for the S&P 500, and uh, we're in this period where uh, which is historically a bullish phase for the market, and that is really when the Fed pivoted, that was back in October, uh, to the first rate cut, which we expect is some, sometime in June. Uh, that typically is a, is a time for the market where almost everything works. So we've had a very concentrated market in the last year in certain names. Uh, there was this phenomena of the MAG-7, uh, well, we've seen the market broaden out now already. So if we looked at the, the difference or the spread between equal-weighted and cap-weighted uh, uh, companies in the S&P 500, the, the maximum spread was about 14%. Well, we're down to about uh, 5% at this point. So we've seen certainly a broadening out from the, the typical tech stocks or communication stocks or uh, semiconductor stocks that we've seen that have been driven the market. So, but this is also the period where, where investors and, and clients uh, climb the, what we call the wall of worry. And then we're at this uh, point now where the markets have broken out. So we're above the previous peak that was before the market went into the bear market in 2022. So there's a lot of head scratching. How could we be at an all-time high here, given all the doom and gloom that we saw in the past year or so from strategists and economists. Well, uh, I'll try to explain that a little bit in this, uh, in this video and give you some kind of a roadmap into what's to come. So let's look at uh, consumer net worth. Uh, we got some data today on consumer sentiment and it was off the chart. And we're not surprised by that because typically when consumer net worth makes a new high, uh, you have a strong consumer sentiment is a byproduct of that, obviously. And you see a, there is a six-month lag between consumer spending and consumer net worth. So given how strong the market has been in terms of uh, equity returns and asset prices, there is this six-month lag between consumer spending and consumer uh, sentiment and net worth. Uh, that bodes well for GDP going forward. I mean, the bears on the economic front have been pointing in the past to the lead, leading economic indicator actually going down, but we're seeing now an uptick in the leading economic indicator for the U.S. economy, which is quite, quite nice. So in that sense, we, we have seen a floor under GDP uh, and all of the negative scenarios regarding recessions and things like that are most economists and strategists at this point no longer believe we are uh, looking at a recession anytime soon, or we may even avoid a recession altogether. So let's let's look at uh, inflation for a moment and this debate on inflation uh, on the supply side, but also on the demand side. And when we talk about supply side, we're really talking about supply chains. So, you know, we woke up the other day seeing this enormous freighter uh, plow into this bridge in Baltimore. And, and of course, you know, the first thing is, oh my gosh, you know, there's, you know, obviously uh, lives were lost, which was tragic, but also how does this affect supply chains? And, you know, we've been focusing on shipping uh, in the last couple of months, given what's happening out in the Middle East with uh, the Houthis basically making it very difficult for ships coming from the Arabian Gulf and from Asia to go through the Suez Canal. So you've had ships now going the longer route, which is actually the, the more bumpy route, route in, the, in, the, in the ocean uh, around the, the Horn of Africa. So there was a worry that supply chains would be disrupted and that would be uh, further exacerbating these supply side problems about inflation. So if you remember with the pandemic, we had supply chains completely uh, 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 disrupted and that was the, the largest cause of our inflation was probably due to those factors. And we have, we've come from 9.1% inflation now to about three. And a lot of that has to do with supply chains that have been normalized. So there's a great chart that I can send you from the New York Fed that basically shows a normalization of, of uh, supply chain pressures. 
But it's interesting, supply chain presser, uh, pressures that were we had before the pandemic were more related to things like trade wars. So we saw our a, a big amount of our CEOs uh, being invited to China in the last couple of days. And, you know, it's, it's a big question mark. Where are we going, especially with the, uh, with the, the two candidates for president uh, who both want to be very tough on China when it comes to tariffs? Trade wars tend to be inflationary. Uh, and we've seen a move of a lot of companies, not just from a, a um, trade war point of view or tariff point of view, but also from a geopolitical strategic point of view, reshoring manufacturing to their home home economies. And that's that's something uh, in the near term certainly adds to inflationary supply pressures that we're seeing. So um, turning from supply to the demand part that's driving inflation, uh, that's the part that the Fed can actually control. Uh, and we'll see if the Fed can engineer uh, CPI inflation to go from where we are now, 3% to their 2% target. Let's turn to money supply. So, uh, look, I'm a trained economist as well, and I learned in school uh, from, you know, the greats uh, like Milton Friedman that uh, inflation tends to be a, a money supply issue. So if we look at the traditional uh, measure of money supply, which is M2, and put that chart on top of uh, CPI, it's a perfect fit, actually. And it's interesting how we can see how with money supply coming down, uh, actually it coincides quite perfectly with, uh, with uh, CPI, but there's an 18-month lag. So if you have the Fed talking about or being a bit more uh, confident about uh, future inflation coming down, and we saw this in the Q&A also with Jay, Jay Powell just the other week. Um, the two factors, supply chains, which, which is the uh, supply-driven factors, and the demand-driven factors that, that we're seeing in the economy and money supply, they're all pointing to, to a, a moderating inflation rate going down the road. And we look, we got the, the revised reading on GDP for the fourth quarter. It was 3.4%. Uh, that's down from 4.8% in the third quarter of last year. So we're seeing a deceleration of, of GDP. But in terms of consumer net worth and, and the consumer sentiment uh, in these indicators, it looks like the sweet spot for the GDP for 2014 is between 2 and 3%, which creates a very interesting investment environment, for, especially for growth investors. So let's look at some of the uh, commodities uh, that, that are in the news all the time, oil and gas. Look, we, we are in an all-time low uh, natural gas price. And it's almost extraordinary to think that we can be at all-time low natural gas prices given the war in Ukraine. You know, when uh, Russia invaded uh, the Ukraine, it disrupted the entire na uh, the distribution of natural gas into Europe. Uh, obviously, the, the most dependent country on that was Germany. Uh, basically, they had to retool uh, their entire imports for natural gas uh, from being almost 100% dependent on Russia to now importing LNG from the United States. It took them a, a about 200 days to retool their import ca capacity for LNG, and now they are doing that. So uh, it's, it's interesting how natural gas prices, once uh, uh, the Russians invaded uh, uh, the, the Ukraine, they went from about $4 to up to about $10 uh, of, of uh, so it's really an incredible price. And we're back down to around $2 for, for natural gas at this point, which is really extraordinary, which shows the supply chains have adjusted to all the geopolitical issues and is also uh, driven by the fact that the United States is the biggest producer of natural gas and oil. On the oil side, you know, things are also a little bit more complicated. Uh, you know, the fact that the United States is the biggest producer of oil, uh, they really drive, production is an all-time high. They're really driving the fact that we have ample supply of oil. It's no longer OPEC. Uh, so these are all factors that are uh, not adding to inflation at this point. Lithium prices. 
Uh, I mean, they spiked up. I mean, you, you, you know that uh, uh, EVs, electric vehicles, need lithium batteries to function. Lith lithium prices have now declined 80% from the, from the top, uh, which is also adding to this sort of more deflationary environment. So in the more cyclical factors that are driving commodities like gasoline futures are, are rising. And that, always, that has to do with a stronger economy ahead. Lumber. Lumber prices are also climbing. And that has to do with a stronger housing market. I mean, there was a lot of doom and gloom in 2023 about the housing economy uh, here in the U.S. because of high interest rates. Well, the, the thing that's really driving the stronger housing is low inventories. So if I showed you a chart of inventories uh, of, you know, by companies like Redfin, uh, they, it would show you that the, the inventories for new homes and new listings is really low. We had lots of activity during the pandemic when everybody went out to buy a home. Uh, now the supply of listings is really quite low, and that's driving a lot of investment. That's driving uh, home builder activity and so forth. So it's a really strong environment if you're in that housing, housing market. A quick quick uh, turn to China. Uh, look, the economy there is in trouble. Uh, the, the economy is decelerating there. But what's more important for us here as well, also from the inflation front, is that they're exporting deflation. So we're getting also a def So if you think about when you walk into a Walmart and you see all the things that are in a Walmart, about 80% or 70% of the, the things that you buy in a Walmart are produced in China. So those things, year-on-year -year prices are now lower uh, which is also contributing to the fact that we have a lower inflation outlook. So one of the things, just to, to give you an idea, why is the market doing so well here? And, and, and you know, why is the Fed not worried about this last piece, which is going from 3.1% inflation to 2%? Why are they not worried about that when it comes to lowering rates? And it has to do with productivity. And I think we... We don't talk about productivity growth enough. And look, I'm old enough to have been a money manager, a, a, a stock picker in the 1990s when we had this massive surge in productivity. And if you remember in the 1990s, we built the internet. But I, I remember very, very clearly the period in 1994 and 1995, it was doom and gloom. We were uh, coming out of the savings and loans crisis. There were 1,400 savings and loans, banks and thrifts that went bust. I mean, it was doom and gloom. But this was just the beginning of the World Wide Web. We were talking about massive uh, new technologies and implementing that. And there was a massive surge in productivity. And in, during those days, you may remember, Greenspan called that the new era, era of growth. And that really was this period. It was a very special period from 1995 probably to 2000, where you had massive returns in the market coming off of a very bearish uh, kind of an environment, uh, and it created amazing returns. I mean, it feels a little bit like that today because productivity uh, growth was negative coming out of the pandemic. So we had, uh, you know, the, the, this notion that sitting at home made you more productive is was debunked, clearly. So, but now we have this new technology, which is called generative AI, which has been really very similar to the, the period in the 1990s, but even we would argue even stronger, creating this productivity growth that we're seeing that's been being driven by technology that we've seen that in the last year. So if you look at the 2.6% the productivity growth uh, in the, uh, the reading for the fourth quarter, uh, we expect productivity growth to rise even more. And if we take 2.6% productivity growth and add 1% uh, population growth, you get 3.6% growth, uh, GDP growth, basically, that is free of inflation. So if you take nominal uh, GDP growth, we can go up to 3.6% and not overheat the economy. So this is very, very important. Productivity growth plus population growth gives you the cover and gives the Federal Reserve and Jay Powell, Jay Powell the cover to lower rates in the second half of the year because it won't overheat the economy. 
There's a lot of economists and strategists out there that are talking about, oh my gosh, no, the, the Fed shouldn't lower rates and shouldn't normalize rates uh, because it will overheat the economy because we have a pretty strong economy already. Well, no. Uh, the reason uh, Jay Powell can do it and the Fed can lower rates and normalize the yield curve the way it should, shorter, shorter rates on the, on the short end and longer, longer rates on the long end, it's because of productivity growth. And, and that's a very, very important thing. And product, when you get productivity growth in an economy like this, and you get rates going down, and you have stable GDP, that is a great environment to invest in. So we're quite, quite optimistic uh, when it comes to that outlook. So just one last comment on bubbles. I mean, we get this question all the time, are we in a bubble? And look, I've been doing this for 30 years now as a portfolio manager, uh, and I can tell you, look, the, we've, if, you, if I showed you a chart, and we're happy to send it to you, on using price to earnings ratio, using trailing, uh, trailing, trailing earnings estimates, you can look at this from 88, 19, sort of the 80s until to today. The, the big bubbles were, you know, in the 1990s, uh, that bubble came apart in 2001. That's when the price to earnings ratio of the S&P 500 hit was over 30 times. So the average of that, uh, of that, uh, uh, of the PE ratio of the S&P 500 since 1988 is about 18 times. So we hit 31 uh, times in 2001, and that, that certainly was a bubble. It felt like a bubble at the time. I remember doing research on companies that had no earnings and no revenues, and we had to uh, value companies based on clicks, and that certainly came apart in 2001. Uh, then the next bubble that we saw was the subprime uh, mortgage bubble, you know, that was the 2008-9 period, that was the Great Recession. Uh, you had also, you had price to earnings ratios for the S&P 500 going to almost 30% um, and then collapsing after that. The last bubble that we've had was actually in around 2020. We went to about 26, 27 times uh, for the S&P 500 and that was the, what we call the e-commerce bubble. Remember when we shut the economy down, uh, valuations on anything that was e-commerce went up like crazy. And that had to do with the fact that everything was going to the cloud. We were purchasing everything through Amazon. So you had a big sort of valuation gap uh, or, or gapping up of valuations uh, during that period, which was the e-commerce bug. If we, if we look at today, price to earnings ratios today, we're about at 21 times. So it's not a cheap market for sure, but this is not a bubble type economy or a bubble type uh, valuation for, for the equity markets. There are pockets we can talk about, you know, our favorite stock like Nvidia. I mean, certainly Nvidia has had an amazing run in terms of performance. It was up about 200% last year and it's up about 80 or 90% just already in this year, in the first quarter. So, but the, the price to earnings ratio for an NVIDIA is about 38 times. But if we look into the future, if we look at the runway of that theme, of the uh, generative AI theme, and how entrenched or the competitive moat that uh, uh, NVIDIA has in that, in that area, it's quite extraordinary uh, to, to say that this is, this is a bubble at this point. Uh, so we are quite optimistic about where we are in the cycle in terms of um, uh, where we are in the market. Uh, certainly for new money, uh, you know, wait for a dip. I mean, the markets are quite over, overbought at this point, but uh, there, will be, uh, there will be data coming out on the economy in terms of inflation that will probably look, look uh, higher than what people are, are willing to, to stomach at this point. Uh, those uh, inflation data that are coming out just in the next couple of months from a seasonality tend to be higher. So we have to not lose sight of the bigger picture and kind of pull back on terms of the trajectory of core inflation and things like that. But that will give you uh, a chance on the next pullback if you have new money to put it to work then. So that's it, that was a lot. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, give me a call or shoot me an email at bkoep 
pp at cjlawrence.com. Uh, have a good one. Have a good holiday. Happy Easter. All the best.